This program is paid for by the friends and partners of the Ever Living Story. Welcome to the international broadcast ministry of the Ever Living Story with Dr. Jerry Harmon. Here at the Ever Living Story, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. Jerry Harmon. As I said, we've been looking at the uh, birth announcements in the Old Testament. Someone has said that the Old Testament is nothing more than a series of birth announcements announcing the coming of the Messiah. And we looked at the, the prophecy, uh, the first prophecy of Christmas, given really by Moses in Genesis 3.15. Um, and we looked at the prophecy of, of Daniel, where Daniel uh, talked about the coming of the Messiah, and then also Jeremiah, and then Isaiah. And this morning, we're going to look at Micah's prophecy now, normally in a birth announcement, you know, we like to include things that are important to us, you know, the baby's weight and gender and name and, and you know, time of birth and that sort of thing. But here in these birth announcements, um, what we have seen is uh, in the prophecy of Genesis, it gives the reason for his birth. In Daniel's prophecy, it gives the time of his birth. Jeremiah and Isaiah deal with the nature and manner of the birth of the Messiah. And this morning, we're going to look at the place where the Messiah would be born. And we see it again here in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. This is an amazing announcement, an amazing prophecy. And I want you to see just four basic things this morning about this. First of all, the scriptural prophecy. This was announced 700 years before the birth of Christ. I mean, think about that. 700 years before Christ was announced, uh, for, excuse me, before Christ was born, his birth was announced. But the, what's amazing is the specific place where Christ would be born. Now, that's amazing. And, and really, this affirms that the Bible is the Word of God. Bible prophecy is one of the great evidences that prove to us that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. If you doubt that the Bible is God's Word, just look at some of the fulfilled prophecies. Only God can do that. Prophecy is history pre-written and pre-recorded only God can predict the future, and only God can make it come to pass. That is part of being sovereign as God over all. And in this verse here, we see Micah, and it's really not words of Micah. Here, God is speaking very specifically, for he says, yet out of thee shall he, shall he come forth, that is, to be ruler. And it says that um, it is his goings forth unto me, that is to be ruler. I wanted to emphasize the fact that God says his goings forth will be unto me, or he'll be born unto me. And so God is speaking here in this, in this prophecy, 700 years before the birth of Christ. But I want you to see, secondly, the specific place. Again, Bethlehem Ephrata. This is telling us that the Messiah will be born in, in a very specific location. And notice the precise detail. It doesn't just say he'll be born in Bethlehem, but he'll be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. Now, you might think, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is there were two Bethlehems in that day. There was a Bethlehem that was located in the northern territory of Galilee and in the territory of Zebulon. Sometimes it was called Bethlehem, Zebulon. And this was very close to Nazareth, just a few miles away from the city of Nazareth. Um, and and uh, also there was a Bethlehem located in the south, in Judea, this would be about 80 miles south, a very small town. So which Bethlehem was Jesus born in? Was Jesus born in the Bethlehem of the north, in the territory of Zebulon? Well, some might think that. If, if Micah had only said that he would be born in Bethlehem, there would probably be a lot of people that would make the connection that it had to be the Bethlehem up north because that was close to Nazareth. That's where the hometown of Mary and Joseph was, five miles from Nazareth. This had to be the place where he would be born, but that would be exactly wrong. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the south territory of Judea, about 80 miles away. And so Micah was very specific in his prophecy, not just Bethlehem, but Bethlehem of Ephrata, that territory in the south, in the land of Judah. Now, you remember in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came to Herod looking for the, per the birth of the king of the Jews, um, remember Herod called in his scholars and asked them where would it happen, and they quoted this very verse here. The scholars, the scribes, quoted Micah 5, 2, 
knowing that this would be the prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem of Ephrata in uh, the southern territory, just a few miles away from Jerusalem. Now, this is amazing to me because this would be like predicting the president, who the, who the president of the United States is going to be 700 years from now, but not just who the president would be, but the very place that he would be born. Think about that. Think about how amazing that is. Now, if I, say, if I said this, I'm going to give you a prophecy here this morning, that in 700 years from now, the, the, the president of the United States at that time will be born in the United States. How many of you would be impressed with that prophecy? So, of course, he'll be born in the United States. He has to be born in the United States in order to be the president. But what if I, what if I made it a little bit more narrow? What if I said the, the 700 years from now, the president of the United States will be born in Tennessee? You say, oh, well, that's impressive, you know, the state of Tennessee. But what if I made it even, even more narrow, a very small, out-of-the-way place? What if I said 700 years from now, the president of the United States will be born in Bucks, North Tennessee or someplace like that, you know, someplace out of the way, you know, some little town that, and by the way, there is a real Bucks, North Tennessee. I didn't, I didn't cut with that. I pass through it every time I drive up here, you know, back and forth, you know, but who ever heard of a place like that? Some little town no one really knows about, That would be impressive to say 700 years from now, this specific little town is where the president would be born. This is what Micah is doing here. And this is incredible. And Matthew is very careful to point out in his gospel that this precise prophecy. You know why this is important that Matthew point to this? Because there were many going around in Jesus' day saying that Jesus could not be the Messiah because Jesus... This Jesus was from Nazareth. And they would say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You ever heard or read that in the Gospels? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? How can this man be the real Messiah? He's from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? In John 7, verse 27, it says, we know this man whence he is. We know that where he is from. He couldn't be the Messiah, they're saying. The Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem. Listen to John 7, 41. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee, that is up north? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And so there were people in Jesus' day saying Jesus could not be the real Messiah because he came from Nazareth. And the scripture says that he would be born in Bethlehem. And so that's why Matthew and Luke in their Gospels is very clear to say that he was born in Bethlehem. Now, the people in that day, they wouldn't understand how how could that be? If his mother and father were from Nazareth, how is it that he could be born 80 miles south in a place called Bethlehem? What would make a man take his wife, who is nine months pregnant, to go 80 miles south... As the crow flies, we're talking about a difficult terrain, you know, hills and valleys and dangerous places. Why would a man take his wife who's with child all the way down to Bethlehem and where she would give birth? Well, Luke tells us the reason why all of this happened. In Luke chapter 2, you can turn there if you'd like. Look in Luke chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So Luke tells us why. He tells us just how God orchestrated the events in the life of Mary and Joseph so that his word would be fulfilled. Here's Mary. She's with child of the Holy Spirit. She's nine months pregnant, about to give birth. But her and Joseph, there they are in Nazareth. And if she gives birth to Christ in Nazareth, then the scripture is not fulfilled. God's word falls to the ground. And he therefore could not be the savior of the world. 
because this prophecy would not be fulfilled. But you know what? God is in control of history. He's in control of things. So here's this guy in Rome named Caesar Augustus. He names himself Augustus, which means the great one, the honorable one, you know. He thought he was on an ego trip. He thought he was in control. But actually, the sovereign God was in control. He made a decision that, that to do a, a census over all the world and the empire, which meant two important things for the fulfillment of this prophecy. First of all, that all those had to go back to their hometown. All the Jewish people had to go back to their original hometown uh, for this census um, in order for it to be accurate. Um, the word here is, uh, has the idea of taking a census for the purpose of a military service and for the purpose of taxation. This was done every 14 years. And so the Jews had to return to their, uh, to their ancestral home, which for Joseph and Mary was Bethlehem. The Jews keep very careful and detailed records of their family. So they had to go back to Bethlehem in order to fulfill this order, this law that was given by Caesar Augustus. Again, here's Caesar thinking he's in charge, but actually it's God the Father who's in charge. And there's a second thing that, we have to, that has to happen here. There has to be a deadline. Again, why would Joseph take Mary when she was great with child uh, on a difficult journey at this stage of her pregnancy well, because there had to be a deadline there in order for, for him to make this long journey. This was no coincidence. God was orchestrating all of these things. Had, had it not been for this, Jesus would have been born in Nazareth. Again, the scripture would not be fulfilled. But every single detail was in the hand of Almighty God. And Joseph took Mary, and they made this long journey down to the south territory, into Judea, into the city of Bethlehem, because the Bible says here in the Old Testament, 700 years before the birth of Christ, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Ephrata. But we can even get more specific, I think, you know, if you go to Bethlehem today, you can go to a church called the Church of the Nativity. I've been there several times um, they're, they built a church over a cave. They think that's the cave where the, Jesus was born. The church was built over the cave in 326 AD. Um, this, is, this is where the traditional site of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was identified by Justin Martyr in the second century as the actual place, but it was actually the mother of the emperor Constantine that, that we can thank for the selection of the birthplace of Christ, and that's why a church was placed over this cave, and if you go there to the Church of the Nativity, you can normally stand in a long line that leads down to a little narrow set of stairs, and at the bottom, they have the supposed actual location where Christ was born. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically where. The only clues that Luke gives us in his gospel is that two things. First of all, there was a manger, and there was no room in the inn. That's the two things that we know for sure. Now, since there's a manger, many people assumed it was in a stable behind, you know, there's no room in the inn. You know, we have images of a Motel 6 in our mind, our Western mind, you know. And behind the Motel 6, there was a barn, and he was born in a barn, in a, in a, in a stable there, placed in a manger, and so on. That's how we think in our mind. But we have to go back into the Jewish world. First of all, the word that is used for inn is the word uh, kataluma, and when Luke uses this word, he only uses this word one other time in his gospel, and it's when it's referring to the upper room. Remember, Jesus told his disciples, go and prepare an upper room. The word for upper room is the same word, kataluma, in. And what it simply means is a guest house. You know, back in this day, every Jewish home had a guest house, an upper room they would use for guests. And so it's not hard for us to understand that during this census, family members are coming back to the family house, perhaps, and Mary and Joseph got there, and there were already guests in the guest house. There was no room in the Cataluma for them, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, because of that, they have to go somewhere else. Again, you know, we think of a motel or an inn, um, and so a lot of our plays are based on that, you know. Uh, there's an innkeeper. Well, the Bible doesn't mention an innkeeper, all right? You heard about that one Christmas play where the 
little boy was playing the innkeeper and Mary and Joseph came and he had to go and tell them there's no room. And, you know, he's going through the part in the play and, and basically the innkeeper looks and says to Mary and Joseph, I'm sorry, I have no room. And they had a real sad look on their face and they turn to walk away and the little boy kind of ad libs and he goes, oh, all right, I've got room. We'll make room. Come on in. <laughs> totally messed up the whole play. But the Bible says there was no innkeeper. It just says there was no room in the inn, but again, the word catalumna just means guest house. You have to remember, Bethlehem was a very small village. They probably didn't have an inn. If Luke wanted to talk about an inn, he would have used the, used the word pandokion. That is the word for a motel or an inn. He does use that word in his gospel, but he uses it in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember what happened? Um, here's a man co- traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He falls among thieves. And uh, there he's left dying, and the Good Samaritan comes, and he takes him to a pandokion, an inn. And then he gives to the pandokios, the innkeeper, you know, uh, you know two, two coins to take care of the man, you know. So if Luke wanted to say that there was an inn, he surely would have used that word there. But that's not the word that is used here in this story. Again, all we know is that there was no room in the guest house, and that Jesus was placed in a manger. But there is a verse of Scripture that some scholars point to as more of a specific place. Look in Micah. You're in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Go back to chapter 4, verse number 8, and there's a very interesting verse here that scholars debate, in verse 8, where it says, And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. This notice tower of the flock. In Hebrew, it's literally the Migdal Eater or the watchtower of the flock. So according to this, uh, um, to this passage, some scholars believe that the Messiah would be born um, and be revealed at the watchtower of the flock or be born at Miguel Eder or revealed from this watchtower Miguel Eder. Now, what was a watchtower? What does it have to do with flocks and sheep? Well, a watchtower was used by shepherds to keep watch over their flocks. And it was also a place where lambs were born. Cooper Abrams, in his article on this, says, quote, this watchtower from from ancient times was used by the shepherds for protection from their enemies and wild beasts. It was also the place where ewes were safely brought to give birth to the lambs. In this sheltered building slash cave, the priests would bring in the ewes which were about to lamb for protection. And these special lambs came from a unique flock that was designated for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. And so that's very interesting um, that one of the priest's duties was to verify lambs that were born that were worthy for sacrifice that had to be without blemish and without spot. And they would wrap the newborn lambs in swaddling clothes Uh, And the shepherds who kept them were men who were trained for this royal task. They also had to keep it clean. Rabbinical rules demanded cleanliness and holiness there at a place like that when they were birthing these lambs that were to be the sacrifice. Uh, Alfred Eldersheim, the great Jewish scholar in his book, The Life and Times of the Messiah, he wrote this. He said that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem was settled conviction. Equally so was the belief that he was to be revealed from Migdal Eder, the tower of the flock. He goes on to say this, was, this watchtower was um, used. Um, it was, uh, he quotes a passage from the Mishnah, a Jewish writing, to conclude that the flocks which pastured there in that region were destined for temple sacrifice. So it's very possible that when Mary and Joseph came to the house, the guest house was full There was no room there, so is it possible then that they went to this watchtower of the flock when the guest house was filled? But the question would be, how close would this watchtower be to Bethlehem? Would it be within the vicinity of the town in order to fulfill the prophecy that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? According to Eusebius, that Magdal Eder was located within 1,000 paces of uh, the, the, the town of Bethlehem. And this, this tower is also mentioned in the Old Testament. You remember when Rachel died? Genesis 35, verse 12, talks about this. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, that is Ephrathah, same word, which is Bethlehem. 
And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is, the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread out his tent beyond the tower of Edar. So when Jacob and Rachel were on their way to Bethlehem, she died on her way there, and he buried her right there by the tower of Edar, the Bible says. In the way, in the Hebrew, we could say by the road. As they were coming into Bethlehem, he buried her right there by the road as they were coming into Bethlehem. Close enough that perhaps it could be rightly said that the Messiah was revealed from this specific place there at Migdal Eder. Now, scholars debate over this. I'll let you come to your own conclusion, but we do know this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, just like the Bible says. And more importantly than the place is the special person. Look in chapter 5, look at verse number 2. But thou Beth, Again, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Listen to this. Whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. God the Father chose Bethlehem as the place where his son would, be, would come into the world as a man. Notice where it says, he shall come forth unto me. Or we could say for me, and that's in the emphatic position. In other words, the Messiah was, first of all, for the Father's benefit. The Messiah was to fulfill the purpose that God the Father had in his heart. And that was the plan of redemption, to bring salvation to the world. It was for God the Father's benefit that he came. Now, again, I've, I said this in our Christmas, living Christmas tree, and I'll say it again. The gospel of Jesus Christ starts with the holiness of God. That's where it starts. You have to first believe that God is holy. And by the way, that's what the Ten Commandments reveal. It's a crime that the Ten Commandments have been pulled out of certain schools and things like that. You know why? Because the greatest pre-salvation tool for evangelism is the Ten Commandments. Because you know why? It shows that God the Father is holy and that we are sinful which means we need a Messiah. But God the Father's holiness demands that sin be punished. And yet God's nature of love doesn't want to punish us. So God the Father sent his son into the world to, to basically resolve the dilemma that he had. His holiness demands that sin be judged. His love doesn't want to judge us. So Jesus Christ on the cross took the wrath of God the Father on himself. So now God's holiness is satisfied because sin was judged in Christ, and God's mercy and love is satisfied because, because of Christ, salvation is now offered a gift to us. His mercy is satisfied, his love is satisfied. That's why when it says here, Micah says, you know, first he'll be born for me. God the Father is saying, this is for my purpose. This is to complete redemption. But notice also it says, whose goings forth have been of old from everlasting. Everlasting is the word olam. It's used in connection with eternity. It can mean from eternity on. He came from eternity. He existed before Bethlehem. Jesus' beginning was not in maternity, but in eternity. God became a man. This is the greatest miracle, the greatest mystery, how God could become a man. But it's what Scripture tells us. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Can you imagine? Uh, Jerry Vines, the great Baptist preacher, imagines Jesus going to the temple. Remember when he was 12 years old, he went to the temple and he talked to the scholars there at the temple. Jerry Vines imagines the conversation going something like this. One of the learned doctors strokes his beard and says, son, how old are you? Well, he says, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old, but on my father's side, I'm older than my mother and as old as my father. You see, he was both God and man. On his mother's side, he got thirsty. On his father's side, he was the water of life. On his mother's side, he got hungry. On his father's side, he took a little lad's lunch and he fed thousands with it. On his mother's side, he was homeless. He had no place to lay his head. But on his father's side, he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. On his mother's side, he wept at the grave of Lazarus. On his father's side, he resurrected Lazarus from the grave. As God, he knew all things. But as a man, he grew in wisdom. As God, he had all power. But as a man, he got tired, and he fell asleep on a boat. 
As God, he was everywhere, but as a man, he was at one place at one time. You say, how can both of those natures dwell in one person? I don't know. I don't know. Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But I'll tell you this, beloved, I believe it with all my heart. God had to become a man in order to bring salvation to us. Salvation from what? What do we say from? Sin. But more specifically, and people forget this. Remember I said that we have to remember that the gospel begins with the holiness of God. We are saved from God the Father's wrath for sin. Because let me tell you something, beloved. There is a real hell that burns with real fire. And for those who do not know Jesus Christ, that is their eternal destiny. And so when we say we're saved, we mean saved from sin, but sin that will cause us to go and spend eternity in a real place called hell. That's the bad news. We don't like to talk about the bad news, but you know what? It's the bad news that makes the good news good. Jesus came to deliver us from sin and the wrath of the Father against sin with his own death there on the cross. That's the the final part of this prophecy. We saw the scriptural prophecy, the specific place, the special person, this, this one from eternity, the ruler of Israel, but the saving purpose. He came to deliver us from sin. Jesus didn't come to give people the American dream. He didn't come to fulfill all of your heart's desires and all your wishes, to do whatever you think he should do for you. That's not why he came. He came to deliver you from sin. He came to reconcile your relationship to God the Father. And until you get that settled, nothing else in life matters. This is the most important issue in life. If you're here today looking for a formula on how you can be successful, you came to the wrong place. What you'll get here is how you can be reconciled to God the Father through Jesus Christ. The gospel is the greatest message in the world. You know why? Because the problem with man today is sin. That's the problem. I think of the story of the great preacher, Dr. Adrian Rogers. He sat down on a plane one time. To watch an extended version of today's message from Dr. Jerry Harmon, go to everlivingstory.org. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. This is The Ever-Living Story with Dr. Jerry Harmon.